Today's video lecture concentrates on Locke's representationalism. I'll be reiterating why Locke is viewed by most, but admittedly not all, philosophers as a representationalist. And I'll be looking at why some see his conception of ideas as problematic. Last video I focused on explaining the basics of Locke's theory of perception, and how and why he thinks that we only engage with the objects of the world indirectly through our, our ideas of sensory objects. Because Locke thinks ideas play a mediating role in perception, I emphasize that his theory of perception is representationalist. Locke argues that what we engage with when we have an experience of external objects is the idea those ideas generate in us via our sensory organs. This means that for Locke, perception is a matter of having ideas. Today I'm going to focus on how his theory is interpreted primarily by late 20th century and present day philosophers. I will also walk us through the Tamita article that I've assigned for this week and on which your reading quiz three is focused. We'll look at questions about what Locke means by ideas and whether his conception of ideas is a credible explanation for what perception is. So one question we'll be looking at is what exactly Locke means by ideas. We'll see that there is some debate in the literature on whether his view of ideas is coherent, whether it's too much or too strong, or, on the other hand, whether fleshing out what Locke has in mind by ideas irons out some of the worries scholars have about his theory of perception. One question that scholars ask of Locke's theory is what the difference is between having ideas and perceiving. Is it the same thing? Or is it something different? Are ideas an action, a way of perceiving? Or are they mental entities, like mental objects, that the mind inspects in order to have a perception? Scholars have argued either that this isn't clear in Locke, or they've proposed one or the other possibility in order to reject or defend Locke's view. First, let's take a step back and review some of the ideas I talked about last time. I said last time that Locke tells us that the mind can only engage with ideas, not with raw sense data. Our experience of objects is in a sense like this. The sensory organ takes in raw sense data that it converts into an idea that reflects the object. We then get a mental picture, an idea, which is inside of us, the perceiver. So the mind plays this converting role so that the, the object of our thought is an idea that is generated by our sensory exposure to the object. And that's what perception is, on Locke's account. It's a mental registering of ideas that come from, from direct sensory experience. This means that perception is a mental process involving three components. It is, in Tamita's words, a three-term relational pro process. These three terms, or three components, are one, the mind, or the understanding, that can think about the experience, two, ideas, which give the mind something to think about, and three, things themselves, meaning the objects themselves, specifically the objects as they actually are in real life. So perception then looks like this. You have three components with ideas sitting in between the mind and the world of objects. The mind or understanding doesn't engage directly with the things themselves. It engages with ideas as a mediator in order to get to those things. This is why Locke is an indirect realist about perception. The mind has only indirect access to the actual world as it really is. But he is, or at least some interpreters maintain that he is, a certain kind of realist. Locke insists, at least sometimes, that our ideas do reflect what the things themselves are. For Locke, there is a real world that looks more or less like what we think it looks like, or 
At least he sometimes says that. But sometimes, as I emphasized last time, he seems to say that we make a mistake by thinking that our ideas resemble the objects. Remember that he said this. To discover the nature of our ideas, the better, and to discourse of them intelligibly, I'll be con it will be convenient to distinguish them as they are ideas or perceptions in our minds, and as they are modifications of the matter in the bodies that cause such perceptions in us. That we so may, uh, that so we may not think, as perhaps is usually done, that they are the exact images and resemblances of things, of something inherent in the subject. Most of those sensations being in the mind, no more the likeness of something existing without us. His claims here can be hard to follow, which is why, as we'll see, there's a deep disagreement to this day on whether Locke does or does not think that we have direct access to the objects as they really are. I will at the end of this video explain Tamita's view that is intended to clarify some of these questions. But for the moment, I want to emphasize some of the confusing elements in Locke's theory that will be the focus of today's lecture. If you remember from last time, I said that Locke thinks that our simple ideas of the color blue, or the sound of a minor, or the sweet taste of honey, are clear and distinct. These simple universals, to use Descartes' terminology, must be real, according to Locke. We can't make them up in our imagination. That's what he tells us at the beginning of, the, of book two. But you may have been asking yourself, what happens to those simple ideas when they become ideas of secondary qualities? The same color blue or sound of A minor, he tells us, are not in the objects, but are rather in us. These kinds of secondary qualities are not supposed to resemble the object as it actually is. But how is this so? Is Locke contradicting himself? We'll see later in this video that we can make sense of what Locke means. It comes down to the corpuscular thesis and the distinction Locke is drawing between our fundamental ideas and the fundamental qualities of objects. The difficulty in reconciling Locke's claims that we do have genuine access to the real world via sensation on the one hand, and his argument that perception involves an engagement with ideas in us that do not resemble the quality of objects themselves, has led many philosophers, both of Locke's own time as well as our own, to reject Locke's theory of perception as deeply problematic. The first and biggest concern is that Locke's three-part theory of perception seems to create a division between the mind on the one side and the objects of perception on the other. Locke places so much emphasis on ideas as the object of thinking that they don't sound like true means of getting us to the objects themselves. They sound like a barrier, like a curtain that blocks us from ever truly coming in contact with the, with the real world. This is why Locke is often accused of giving us a veil of ideas conception of perception, one where ideas actually block perception. This set of images was the relation that I just showed you earlier as the three-part conception of perception. You see how ideas here sit in between the mind and the things. The concern is that Locke's ideas loom large. If all we think about is our, is our ideas, and Locke is wishy-washy about how much our ideas resemble the objects themselves, then it seems that we're unable to ever find out, to ever be able to find out, whether our perceptual experience of anything is like the world as it really is. Here's how present-day philosopher Jonathan Bennett puts the concern. Locke puts the objective world, the world of real things, beyond our reach, on the other side of the veil of perception. So I call this aspect of his thought his veil of perception doctrine. The more usual label, representative theory of perception, is unsatisfactory 
because it does not express what is wrong with the theory. Meaning that Bennett is arguing that Locke is not just any kind of representationalist. He's a much-too-much kind of representationalist, a beyond-representationalism philosopher. It's not just that Locke's view of perception makes use of mental representations, at least on Bennett's understanding. It's that, on Locke's view, mental representations are all we have because those representations put the actual world itself beyond our reach. No one doubts that Locke wants to say that our basic ideas of sensation reflect the actual world. The question is whether his thinking about perception successfully gives us a reason to think that it does. So this is the problem. Despite being an empiricist, it looks like Locke ends up with the same problem that Descartes had. Just like with Descartes, Locke's conception of ideas break off our contact with the actual objects of sensation. All we can talk about for sure is how we experience objects. We lose the things themselves in Locke's ideas-based conception of perception. Thomas Reed was an almost contemporary of Locke's. He was writing less than a hundred years after him. He expressed this concern. We see that Mr. Locke was aware, no less than Descartes, that the doctrine of ideas made it necessary, and at the same time difficult, to prove the existence of a material world without us, because the mind, according to that doctrine, perceives nothing but a world of ideas in itself. Not only Descartes, but Malbranche, Arnaud, and Norris had perceived this difficulty, and attempted to remove it with little success. Mr. Locke attempts the same thing, but his arguments are feeble. Both Reed's and Bennett's concern here stems from Locke's view that ideas are the exclusive object of our perceptions. And here are some places where we do see this thinking in Locke. He writes, the idea, sorry, idea is the object of thinking. And, whatsoever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, I call idea. And, reiterating the quotation I used above, he often sounds like he is divorcing those ideas from the actual objects. He writes, ideas in the mind, qualities in the bodies. Most of those ideas of sensation being in the mind no more the likeness of something existing without us than the names that stand for them are the likeness of our ideas, which yet upon hearing they are apt to excite in us. Another concern, or aspect of the same concern, is, as I suggested a few moments ago, that it isn't clear what precisely ideas are. Perception is clearly an activity of the mind, but what are ideas? Locke says that ideas are the object of thought. But what does he mean by this? Today's philosophers typically distinguish the subject of thought from the object of thought. Locke at times uses these terms in the reverse order or in the reverse of how we would use them today. Normally, in today's usage, you would say that ideas are the subject of thought. The usage here, that ideas are the object of thought, is ambiguous. Does he mean that thoughts are entities that we are thinking about? Or does he mean that they are the means by which we think about things? The latter seems the most intuitive for how we would normally think about ideas, but it also doesn't quite match the language that Locke is using when he says that ideas are the objects of thought. So should we understand Locke's ideas ontologically, as in, as things that have existence? That would be strange, but there are times where Locke seems to be reifying ideas in just this way, as in the passages I just quoted. Peter Dlugos is an uh, in an article that I, I only assigned as optional reading, makes this case. He thinks that Locke, probably unintentionally, presents ideas as mental entities. By the way, if you end up choosing to write your second essay on Locke, you may want to read that article. 
Unlike Tamida, Dlugos defends the veil of ideas interpretation of Locke's theory of perception. I didn't select it for our main focus, only because I wanted to highlight an article that comes to Locke's defense, as I will do in the second half of this video. Lugos points out that there is evidence that Locke himself didn't think of ideas as mental entities or objects per se, but he didn't exactly not think of them this way either. Locke actually seems to have not really considered this question at all. Ontology is a metaphysical consideration, and Locke, a diehard empiricist, isn't interested in metaphysics. What he's interested in here in the essay is more like psychology, he wants to know what the mind experiences and how it experiences it. This is what Locke calls natural history or the historical method. He's not looking to provide, provide any kind of metaphysical definition for the kind of beings, a being ideas may or may not have. Lugos writes, John Norris, for example, questioned Locke as to what sort of entities ideas are, and Locke annoyedly responded, Perhaps I was lazy and thought the plain historical method I had proposed to myself was enough for me. Perhaps I had other business and could afford no more of my time to these speculations. Lugos concludes from this by saying, If we take Locke to be sincere here, as we probably should, then it follows that he himself took ideas to be neither acts nor objects, because both characterizations are, broadly speaking, ontological. But even if Locke didn't want to ask these kinds of questions, he still ends up presenting ideas in a way that calls for an explanation of what kind of thing an idea, as he's conceiving it, is. What we end up with is a lack of clarity on whether Locke's ideas are best understood as acts or as objects, and whether an idea is a kind of mental entity or whether it is some kind of other thing the, or some kind of thing that the mind does. Knowing this, whether ideas are acts or objects, is important for the veil of ideas debate. If ideas are objects or mental entities, as Lugos maintains they must be in Locke's use of the term, then it would mean that ideas are, conceptually speaking, more likely to be a barrier to perception than a means to it. If ideas are an act of the perceiving mind, then they would be less like barriers and more like a means, to, means of understanding, as this illustra illustration suggests. But if ideas are mental entities, then the view looks more like this. This is not to suggest that ideas are entities that exist outside the mind, something that Locke explicitly rejects, but conceptually they would be mental objects that the mind contemplates instead of the objects of sensation. So this brings us back to the main question of the veil of ideas interpretation of Locke's theory of perception. How much do, or even can, ideas give us knowledge of the real world? On Ryle's interpretation, very little. And that's why he thought Locke had to be wrong. He wrote, The assumption of mental proxies for independent realities throws no light on the problem, if it is one, of how we can think about or know things. It embodies a theory, unplausible in itself, which, if true, would make knowledge or even probable opinion about independent realities quite impossible. Now something that we need to note. Ryle, like many of the philosophers we're looking at who accuse Locke of giving us a veil of ideas, was a direct realist. This is a sharp philosophical divide in present-day theories of perception. Representationalism was not terribly controversial in Locke's day. Thomas Reed is a rare, except, a rare uh, example of a philosopher who did think that our senses put us in direct contact with the world of objects. In the early modern period, it was assumed that Descartes was largely right to say that it is philosophically naive to think that our senses reliably reflect the world as it truly is.
Ryle is part of a 20th century pushback on the implications of that view. What are those implications? Essentially, that is the theme of this course. It evokes the question of whether and how much we can truly know the world as it actually is. Now, on my view, denying that the, pro the problem is there doesn't fix the issue. I think our early moderns are identifying a legitimate philosophical worry about perception. Descartes had one solution. He said that reason gives us at least some kind of certainty. Locke had a very different solution. He says that our senses reliably, though indirectly, give us certainty about the world. But Ryle's question, his and several others that you will see referenced in both the Tamita and the Delugos articles, is whether Locke's conception of indirect access to the world can actually give us any true knowledge of the world at all. Now, Locke does, in fact, have an answer to this worry. Or at least he gives us an argument for why we can feel assured that our indirect access to objects via ideas or mental representations is reliable. So I'm going to switch gears here from focusing on what philosophers say is wrong with Locke's view to a defense and explanation of what Locke himself is aiming at. Let's see if we can resuscitate Locke's ideas after all these apparent body blows. Here is where Locke addresses concerns like those of Ryle's directly. He writes, "'Tis evident the mind knows not things immediately, but only by the intervention of the ideas it has of them. Our knowledge, therefore, is real, only so far as there is a conformity between our ideas and the reality of things." But what shall here be the criterion? How shall the mind, when it perceives nothing but its own ideas, know that they agree with the things themselves? This, though it seems not to want difficulty, yet I think there be two sorts of ideas that, we may be assured, agree with things. In other words, Locke here gives us an argument for how two essential kinds of ideas reliably reflect the world of experience. What are those two kinds of ideas? We've seen them already. They are the basic ones he starts off book two with. Simple ideas and complex ideas, he says, do accurately reflect the world as it really is. First, let's consider simple ideas. Here we'll try to sort out the questions I raised at the beginning as to how simple ideas can be both from external objects and also not in the objects themselves. He writes, The first are simple ideas, which, since the mind, as has been showed, can by no means make to itself, must necessarily be the product of things operating on the mind in a natural way from whence it follows that simple ideas are not fictions of our fancies, but the natural and regular productions of things without us, really operating upon us. For they represent to us things under those appearances which they are fitted to produce in us, whereby we are enabled to distinguish the sorts of particular substances, to discern the, discern the states they are in, and so to take them for our necessities. So simple ideas, then, represent specific appearances that do genuinely reflect the objects that we get those simple ideas from. Now, to make sense of that, let's remind ourselves of what simple ideas are. Simple ideas are basic sensory inputs, still ideas, but ideas that cannot originate in us. They can't be invented by the imagination, what Locke calls fictions of the fancy. They have to come from outside of us. How does this work if those simple ideas are not properly speaking in the objects that cause them? As Locke sees it, our sense organs, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, are designed or meant to register specific kinds of sensory inputs. So the eyes pick up light and color, the ears pick up sounds, the nose smells, the tongue tastes, and so on. 
simple ideas are registered from one specific sense only. This isn't to say that this is how we consciously receive information from the world. Locke is talking about a conceptual distinction here. Recognition of simple ideas uh, is how we can register that these three very different objects share something in common. They're all red. We recognize this simple idea of red in multiple kinds of objects. The color red is a specific sensory response to, a, to specific information hitting our eyes. Our minds recognize combinations of these simple ideas and objects in order to formulate complex ideas of objects as being red, round, solid, hot, etc. all at the same time. So earlier I raised a puzzle about what Locke is telling us about simple ideas. I was asking how it is that simple ideas are clear, distinct, and real, but the secondary qualities that match them exist only in the mind. Tamita gives us an explanation to what Locke is getting at. Tamita thinks that what we are getting here from Locke is the fundamental components of his corpuscular thesis, which provides us with a combination of a certain kind of direct realism that ultimately leads him to a representative theory of perception. Tamita makes the case that there is a good reason why Locke sometimes sounds like a direct realist and sometimes sounds like an idealist. The reason is that Locke's indirect realism, as Tamita puts it, has direct realism as a premise in an argument whose conclusion is representationalism. Let me explain. I will reiterate that later. Tamita explains the relationship between secondary qualities and simple ideas in this way. He writes, in brief, Things possess only primary qualities, like bulk, figure, number, situation, and motion, or rest. However, by possessing such primary qualities, they make us perceive those qualities like colors and tastes that they do not possess, namely, they produce ideas of colors, tastes, and like in the mind, and by variously changing the ways other things are. They change the ideas that we receive from them. The proposal is that, though the ideas are in us, they are directly connected to the powers of the object creating that reaction for our senses. To help get a handle on how this might be possible, that something like color can both be in us and also externally caused, I recommend again checking out the video link I posted on Monday for PBS's It's Okay to Be Smarts, What Color Is This Banana? It's not 100% Lockean, but it's pretty close. And it does a really good job at explaining how the sensory perceptors in our eyes play an active role in generating an experience of color that both does and does not reflect what is actually true of an object. Again, if we were in lecture, I would just play the video, but for copyright reasons, I need to just direct you to find it yourself. But do take the time. It's worth it. So that video ends with the line, something to the effect of, so colors, so colors are in the objects, but they are also in us. I think a conception like this can help us make sense of what Locke is getting at. Locke argues that the objects corpuscles, effectively, effectively something like molecules or powers of an object, create in us a simple sensory idea that does not originate in us. You would have to have some sensory reception of the color blue at some point in your life in order to have any idea of what the color blue looks like. Our experience of blue isn't an accident. It is the way that our eyes respond to the particular structure of the object or thing that we are looking at. But that doesn't mean that blue, as we experience it, is literally in the object. What is in the object is a particular structure that our eyes understand as blue. Here's Tamita again. <laughs> 
According to Locke's corpuscular hypothesis, things are single, minute, imperceptible corpuscles, particles, or aggregates of such corpuscles, and each corpuscle in itself possesses only primary qualities. According to him, that when the globules of light strike the surface of a texture, they receive proper rotation, and when these globules of light strike the retina, then the sensation, idea, of white is produced in the mind as a result. So this means that the object's primary qualities, meaning its fundamental substance, substance is the word that Locke uses, we might say, or we might today say basic molecular or atomic structure, structure perhaps, reflects to us these globals or emanating powers that our senses interpret in specific ways. A creature with totally different sense organs might have a totally different kind of experience of that atomic and molecular structure than we do. But as it stands, our senses are such that we receive the apple as being red, or the vibrations off a string as being the key of a minor, or the taste of honey as being sweet. So our senses register the globals that emanate from the object's primary qualities. And what we receive are simple ideas that are real to the extent that they are the mental image that corresponds to those specific kinds of external stimuli. Our mind combines multiple simple ideas to create a complex idea that includes a wide-ranging combination of simple ideas. So then, an apple can be perceived as red, shiny, round, with a green leaf, crisp, tart, and so on. Locke tells us that it is not just the simple ideas that correspond to objects. Complex ideas also accurately reflect the things in themselves. He writes, Secondly, all our complex ideas, except those of substances being archetypes of the mind's own making, not intended to be the copies of anything, nor referred to the existence of anything as to their originals, cannot want any conformity necessary to real knowledge. For that which is not designed to represent anything but itself can never be capable of a wrong representation, nor mislead us from the true apprehension of anything, by its dislikeness to it, and such, excepting those, substance, those of substances, are all our ideas, our complex ideas. Now we just got a bit of new information there about substances and archetypes. These are the primary qualities of objects that I mentioned last time that we can only know about through the secondary qualities that our senses pick up on as simple ideas. I will talk about this in the next video because we'll see that Barclay thinks this is deeply problematic. I'll also address in that video the contentious question of whether shape is a simple idea or not. Locke himself isn't clear. But more on that next time. For today, I just want us to focus on the contemporary conversation about whether Locke is guilty of giving us a veil of ideas or not. We see in Locke's defense of his conception of ideas that he does want to claim that our ideas do genuinely reflect what the objects themselves are. This has led some philosophers to go the opposite way of the ones we saw earlier, who claim that Locke's theory prevents us from knowing about the objects of the world. One major Lockean scholar in particular made the case that Locke is in fact a direct realist after all. There are some scholars, a minority, who claim that the statements I read earlier from Locke imply that he thinks that perception does involve direct access to the things themselves. The most vocal and, and famous of such philosophers is John Yolton. Couldn't find a photo of him, but he is a major Locke scholar from the University of Oxford. And another scholar who also defends a direct realist interpretation of Locke is Anthony Woosley, also of Oxford. Both Tamita and Lugos, by the way, argue that Yolton is wrong. Tamita, though, is less opposed than Lugos is. But here is Yolton's defense of interpreting Locke as a kind of secret direct realist. <laughs> 
Yolton writes, Locke talked of seeing tables and of having ideas of tables, but never of seeing ideas of tables. Woosley is clearly right in stressing that Locke's way of ideas did not commit the category mistake of saying we see ideas, not tables. Yolton goes on, that Locke believed objects and their qualities to be perceptible cannot be doubted on the basis of his texts. Only if we burden ourselves first with a theory of representative perception and interpret that theory in a specific way can we be led to ignore what Locke says. The so-called representative theory of perception is supposed to be threatened with idealism and privacy. Realism is, at best, a postulate or belief. All Locke's use of ordinary physical objects and events talk to the contrary. The doctrine of knowledge via ideas seems to clash with his easy talk of observing objects. Now, once again, I need to make a caveat here. Like Ryle, Yolton is a direct realist. And again, that puts Yolton on the other side of a philosophical divide against representationalism as a coherent theory of perception. But unlike Ryle, whose direct realist commitments led him to vehemently reject Locke's theories, Yolton instead tries to rescue Locke by pulling him over to the direct realist side. Now, I'm here perhaps pressing the case more than Yolton himself might like, but I do want to draw your attention to some underlying reasons why Yolton might be eager to make the case that Locke is not a representationalist, even when most scholars say that he has to be. Yolton both admires Locke and dislikes representationalism, and so it perhaps makes sense that he would want to argue that Locke is not a representationalist after all. But Yolton's view is highly disputed. Still, it does at least give Lockean scholars a strong alternative to the less charitable veil of ideas interpretation. Here is Lugos, who does, endorse, who, who does endorse the veil of ideas view of Locke's theory, and he argues against Yolton. He writes, Yolton has sought clues about Locke's view of ideas in the criticisms of Malbranche that Locke shared with Arnaud. According to Yolton, the benefit of reviewing these criticisms is that they give a sense of the theory of ideas to which Locke does not subscribe. But the validity of Yolton's conclusion is far from clear. All that Locke is denying here, which Yolton has elsewhere acknowledged, is that ideas are mind-independent entities, as Malbranche thought. But we cannot infer from Locke's denial that he didn't think of them as mind-dependent entities or objects. The rejection of ideas as entities separate from the mind and from external objects does not entail the rejection of ideas as entities simpliciter. Locke could hold that ideas are mental objects and still disagree with Malbranche about what kind of object they are. As I noted, Lugos supports the veil of ideas interpretation of Locke. In the preceding passages, he is arguing that Locke does conceive of ideas as mental entities, not as acts, as Yolton proposes. As I mentioned earlier, de Lugos makes the case that Locke's conception of ideas sounds more like mental entities than actions meaning that ideas are things that get in the way of our ability to perceive objects directly. But what Lugos is also arguing here is that Yolton is ignoring too much in Locke by presenting him as a direct realist. Tamita agrees on this point. He also devotes a good chunk of his article to showing that Yolton's direct realist interpretation of Locke has to be wrong. As I mentioned earlier, Tamita, who doesn't think the veil of ideas interpret of interpretation, sorry, think the veil of ideas interpretation is right, has some sympathy for Yolton's arguments. And this sympathy becomes important in Tamita's defense of Locke's theory of perception. But he nonetheless argues that Yolton is wrong to see Locke as a direct realist. Here is Tamita's take. As mentioned previously, some Locke scholars have preferred a direct realist interpretation of Locke. A.D. Woosley criticizes the representational interpretation of Locke on the basis of Locke's criticism of Malbranche's view, 
John W. Yolton claims that, according to Locke, our minds immediately perceive bodies. But from the above, it's clear that Locke's position is that of a representative theory of perception. The reason being, Tamita argues, is that Locke's corpuscular thesis means that, as Locke himself repeatedly reminds us, the ideas in us are distinct from the ideas they produce in us. Tamita writes, The qualities of things themselves that produce ideas in the mind are at least numerically, and in some cases specifically, different from the ideas produced by them. Tamita makes the case that both the veil of ideas interpreters and the direct realist ones are wrong. On Tamita's account, Locke is definitively a representationalist. But because he allows for a certain kind of direct contact with things via his corpuscular thesis, it means that Locke doesn't propose ideas as a kind of blockage between the perceiver and the objects of perception. Tamita's art article is called Locke's Representationalism Without Veil for a Reason. He's arguing that there is a way to understand Locke as a representationalist without going so far as to say that Locke proposes the shocking doctrine that our ideas somehow inhibit us from knowing about the objects of the world. Let's look more closely at the picture Tamita offers us. I personally think it's more, it more plausibly keeps to the spirit of Locke's proposal than either the veil of ideas or the direct realist account does. However, at the same time, I do wonder if Tamita is being a bit overgenerous with Locke, but we'll get to that at the end. So, on Tamita's account, ideas generated in us by the powers emanating from objects give us mental representations that genuinely, genuinely reflect, but not precisely the objects as they are, not precisely the objects as they are in themselves but the powers that they possess, i.e. the powers that the object's primary qualities have on us. In other words, what we experience as the color yellow is not precisely speaking a mirrored account of the specific pigment that is found in an examination of the banana as it is in itself. But nonetheless, our experience of yellow is not arbitrary. It isn't detached from the banana or mentally dreamed up by our minds in a way that is separate from the banana. It's rather that the banana's, banana skin's molecular structure is such that it emits to us a specific kind of light that we can register as yellow. So keeping Locke's corpuscular thesis in mind, we can say that Locke's picture isn't like this one. The ideas don't somehow loom over or in between us and the, I, on the, and the object in a way that blocks our access. It's more like this. The ideas are firmly in the mind as the way that we are able to make sense of the objects that are presented to us. The mental picture then reflects the genuine nature of the objects. But what we have to keep in mind is that our senses are interpreting sensory data in a way that is appropriate to our sensory organs. There is necessarily going to be a difference between the way that our minds convert sense data into ideas and the objects as they are in themselves. Tamita makes the case that Locke's theory of perception contains some elements of direct realism. But he says that shouldn't be a point for confusion or rejection of Locke's arguments. It's rather a feature of Locke's argument itself. He writes, Indeed, we can find Locke's direct realistic tendency in the essay. As I argued on another occasion, I find one such tendency in Locke's wording of things themselves. This mixture of direct realism in Locke's theory of ideas, however, does not mean that his whole theory of ideas is incoherent. This can be readily known from the fact that things in the representative theory of perception qua Locke's basic 
theory and things in the direct realism that sometimes appears in his theory differ somewhat in character. In the case of the representative theory of perception, its framework is comprised of three terms, things, ideas, and the mind or understanding. And the things in this case are what the corpuscular hypothesis regards as things, namely single or aggregates of corpuscles that only have primary qualities in themselves. By contrast, when Locke makes direct realist statements, what, he's re what he refers to by the word things are what we ordinarily regard as things, namely experiential objects. If we bear this in mind and take a fresh look at Locke's theory of ideas, then we can find an intriguing logical structure in the theory. So here's what Timida ends up proposing. It's a claim that is a bit cryptic and one that I think he could have done a better job at explaining, but I will do my best to interpret what he means. What Timida proposes is that Locke uses direct realism as a premise in his argument for representationalism. So what does this mean? Tamita doesn't actually list the premises and conclusion that he has in mind, but I think we can understand him to mean something like this. Premise one is that our senses put us in touch with the things themselves, i.e. direct realism. Tamita suggests that this is why you find Locke making statements that sound very direct realist-like. Locke includes this proposal as part, but only one part, of his theory of perception. The second premise would then tell us that the mind thinks not about direct sensory data, but about ideas. This is why Locke begins Book 2 specifically with the statement that the object of thought is ideas. Another premise would add that, as Locke tells us early on in Book 2, that perception is a mental activity that involves ideas, not direct sensory data. This is why an image that you don't notice, or a sound that you don't pay attention to, and so didn't hear, is not perception. Perception is exclusively when you mentally register a sensory experience. Here's another premise, again that Locke emphasizes and devotes much time to proving. Secondary qualities of objects are not in the objects themselves. They are created in us by powers or corpuscles emanating from the object's primary qualities. And finally, another premise. The things themselves emit corpuscles that evoke specific sensory reactions in us. Conclusion. Sensation is experienced indirectly via mental representations of the things themselves. So what Tamita is proposing is that direct realism is one step in a multi-step argument that ends up proving that we must be indirectly in contact with the things themselves. The first step does say that we know about the world, the, object, uh, the objects of the world, but the subsequent argument or premises clarify that we, can, we only come by that knowledge indirectly through our mental representations that are caused by the objects. So to reiterate then, as Locke himself insists, both simple and complex ideas bear a direct resemblance to the powers the objects have. We must but we must recognize the difference between the powers of the object and what the object is in and of itself. And as, it, as I suggested last time, this might not be so crazy as all that. A genuine experience of a flower, if that is we had totally different, a totally different kind of sensory system, would look extremely different than the way we normally experience flowers. Under a microscope, a flower is a totally different kind of thing. What we know about the molecular structure of flowers, their pigmentation, the way they reflect some lights, but not some light, but not others, the chemicals they emit from spores that we experience as scent, is extremely different from the beautiful, smooth, 
brightly colored and fragrant smelling flower. So to reiterate then, Tamita concludes that Locke is not a direct realist. He's definitely a representationalist. But he also rejects the veil of ideas interpretation of Locke's representationalism. He denies that Locke's conception of ideas is so strong that it acts as a veil or a curtain between us and the objects. I've been pressing this because one of your, S your essay two options will be to consider whether you think Locke's view of ideas is indeed more like a veil than a means of perception. Tamita is being very charitable in his interpretation of Locke. As I said earlier, I do think that Tamita's interpretation is more in line with what Locke himself intends. But I want you to consider the question yourself if you end up choosing this essay option. Locke may want to give us a picture of how we indirectly access the things themselves, but the question is whether his philosophy successfully persuades us that he is right on that. We'll see next week that two of Locke's immediate successors in the early modern period were not convinced that he had. Now, Note that I have been making a connection between Locke's conception and contemporary science, mostly as a way to help make Locke's view more intuitive and understandable for us. But do notice that I'm also being rather generous in doing that. Locke's view is not identical to modern science. There are not a whole lot of contemporary philosophers who truly endorse Locke's view mostly because he struggles to connect his conception of ideas to the, uh, to the world of experience in a way that is considered credible to contemporary thinkers. Specifically, few philosophers or scientists would say that the direct object of perception is our own ideas about objects. So the choice will be yours if you write your paper on Locke. You may defend his claim, or you may dispute it. In either case, you'll need to back up your reasons in order to make a single compelling case for one side or the other. So let's leave it there for this week. The next video will advance the conversation by seeing how two English early modern philosophers, namely Berkeley and Reed, disagreed with Locke. And if you liked Locke's view and want to hear more support for it, hang tight. Hume is basically in full agreement with Locke, and he aims to fix some of Locke's problems with the things themselves in his, with his, through his copy thesis. So that is the end of today's lecture. Please read Tamita's article for your Monday reading quiz. Your essay one is due on Friday the 22nd, and new essay topics will be posted by the weekend for essay number two. Thanks everybody for listening and I will talk to you next time.